colleagues, just a uh, couple of words from, from me. First of all, thank you for uh, coming to the lecture. Um, the context is that, uh, as uh, certainly colleagues in education will recall from a diagram that was put up, it's very important that at a faculty level we have uh, some joined up research strategy, which is part of the overall faculty's research environment uh, story, as it were, for the next REF. Uh, that's uh, sort of a very practical um, context for, for this. And what we've um, uh, decided to do this year is rather than um, having a, 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 what, what will by, by definition be a rather disparate uh, collection of individual topics based upon doctoral theses, uh, is to go, to a th go for a theme uh, and, and then from that uh, theme and the lectures that come out of that theme, um, which colleagues have very kindly uh, indicated they'd be willing to deliver, to produce an edited book. So that's the, that's the, uh, you know, the, the broader context and the end game here is to produce an edited book on this particular theme. So I don't want to say any more because I'm probably in danger of stealing Tony's thunder. Uh, so I won't say any more about that. Uh, thank you again for coming and there will be a, a series of these lectures and I certainly look forward to seeing you at those and I'll hand over to Tony. Hi, thank you. I'm not quite as tall as Kenneth, so I need to put the microphone down a little bit. Uh, as with all good people who are introducing these things, I'll be incredibly brief because the, the whole point of today is about what uh, Mike has to say. And just to kind of revisit what Kenneth said, uh, we used to have a series of doctoral lectures, which were very successful in their own right, but as Kenneth has said already, they were disparate. And this year, what we thought we'd do is we'd take this one stage further and we try to introduce a series of seminars which are based on research and also based on people's areas of interest uh, that were all collected together in the kind of dangerous title of Dangerous Ideas in Education. Uh, very often uh, it's easy to be comfortable in terms of the things that we talk about in our research and we thought what we'd like to do is to be slightly more provocative. So the whole point of this series is, is to both, it's about knowledge, uh, transmitting ideas, but also to challenge some of the kind of status quo. Um, the seminars, uh, I think we've got 10 in total to date, uh, and they're going to be delivered by a mixture of both uh, people from within the faculty and people from outside the university. Um, the, uh, the, the linking theme for all the uh, seminars is we're cha challenging various paradigms in education. Uh, but I'll say more about that uh, later on in the series. Um, these seminars are going to be filmed, so, you know, but actually the filming is taking back to front, so it's the person here who gets the, uh, the kind of beauty treatment, as it were. And what we hope to do is to post the seminars, what well, we will do is post the seminars on a, a, web, a dedicated part of our uh, faculty website, which means that both, if you don't manage to be here for the, the seminars, um, you uh, do get access to the material at a later date, and also we hope it can be useful possibly as a teaching resource as well. So at the end of the day, after this series of seminars, what we hope to do is to bring the material together collectively and produce a book which is uh, loosely entitled at the moment Dangerous Ideas in Education, although we might have to reconsider that at some point in time. The first of these Dangerous Ideas in Education is going to be delivered by Mike, and the theme of what he's going to talk about is the knowledge economy in higher education. And it's an incredibly topical subject, and if you're involved in higher education, you know how it's changed quite radically, certainly over the past two or three years. And a word that's, or a phrase that's constantly repeated is this notion of knowledge economy. I think Mike is going to test that as a, as a concept. We are very lucky to have Mike here. Uh, he comes to us uh, with uh, quite a varied background. Um, he undertook his doctoral studies at Cambridge, and at various points in time he's taught at Cambridge. I think he's taught at Oxford and taught at Birmingham University. He was a Kennedy Scholar in Harvard University. Uh, he also uh, was the recipient of the Palgrave Times Higher Education Humanities and Social Sciences Writing Prize. Uh, and he has, I think your last reincarnation, Mike, before he came here, was actually uh, teaching uh, head of politics and history in a uh, boarding school, big boarding schools, I think uh, you ought to know. Uh, and also, which I think is uh, 
possibly uh, quite important in, relation, in terms of what he's going to speak about today is he was involved in uh, politics in the sense that he was a political advisor for one of the uh, political parties in Westminster and certainly had a hand in writing some of the speeches for this political party. Uh, that's about all I want to say. Um, I'm going to hand over to Mike very, very shortly. Because this is about testing ideas, uh, what we hope to do, Mike's going to speak for about 40 minutes or thereabouts, and at the end there will be an opportunity for people to ask questions. Okay? So it's these questions really which complete the package. So please feel free to think about that question that's going to make Mike squirm, hopefully, and test his ideas as fully as possible. Mike, over to you. Well, I'll just jump off by picking up on Tony's last point in the intro about me, because I like to talk about me, um, which is just to talk about the background as a policy advisor. Because I think what I want to talk about today is I want to talk about the historical evolution, the origins of a particular policy discourse. Um, I want to talk about the knowledge economy in historical perspective. So what I want to do in this approach is marry my train as an historian with my experience as a policy advisor and try and sort of throw some light on why policies are successful in terms of their discourse, why they get mass appeal, why they last and why they don't. So in terms of today's talk, there's a slight misdescription in the sense that when we talk about the knowledge economy, many of you think, right, he's going to go on about the Brown Review, he's going to talk about stuff from the last couple of years. And I am, but only in passing, because what I want to do is I want to provide an archaeology of where the term came from in the British context. It's not a British term. It's a term that has been imported and appropriated. But I want to historicise it to show why it has taken on a life of its own within British higher education, because it has. It has had particular impacts in British higher education which are dissimilar to those it's had in other places. It's had some similar impacts, but it's had some dissimilar ones too. And I want to talk about higher education in the broader context of politics. Um, a lot of scholars, certainly in the historical tradition, working on universities, working on higher education, have often left the politics out to a certain extent. I mean, this isn't something that is common in the history of 19th century education, but it's definitely something that is common in the post-war history of education in the UK, where politics can sometimes be made reference to in very broad strokes without linking it directly to what is under discussion. So there's several objectives today. One is to historicise the knowledge economy, explain where it came from in the British context. One is to offer a critique in terms of how we look at policy generally. And another one is to offer a different approach to how we do the history of education in post-war Britain specifically. Now, I'm not going to apologise from reading from a text, but there you go, so I will begin. Okay, the seminar is about the history of a term that did not exist in the period under discussion. The period I'm primarily going to look at today is the first few decades after the Second World War before bringing it up to date towards the end. Now today, the language of the knowledge-based economy, or more prosaically, the knowledge economy, is ubiquitous in the world of education policy making. Um, in more or less perceptible ways, the terrain has shifted in Whitehall. The Department for Education and Employment was first renamed the Department for Education and Skills. We then had a short-lived Department for Innovation, Universities and Skills. It wasn't for nothing that universities were sandwiched in the title between innovation and skills. Um, the transition within British government to an agenda of education for economic growth has disproportionately focused that policy-making agenda on universities. For new labour, it was a sine qua non. The universities and other institutions of higher education were places which existed primarily to develop economic innovation and economic skills. Internationally, as Bob Jessup notes, the discourse of the knowledge-based economy has, and I quote, become a powerful economic imaginary in the last 20 years or so, and has as such been influential in shaping policy paradigms, strategies, and policies across many different fields of social practice. So this talk represents the excavation of the context of the knowledge economy as a policy paradigm in English higher education. Just a note on terms, I do speak a lot about English higher education and British governments. There's a straightforward reason for that. The way in which the British government related to English universities was dissimilar from the way it related to Scottish universities. There were parallel structures and English universities bore the brunt of the reforms in this period. But nonetheless, British government objectives spanned both England and Scotland. But why did the knowledge economy take root so forcefully in the UK? 
What were the implications of this? The historiography of post-war English higher education is in its infancy. Though political historians have been working on the history of the period since 1945 for some time, and historical analyses of policy have been forthcoming, universities remain something of a lacuna, an area best left to sociologists and those identifying more firmly as educational researchers, which historians are often want to do. Um, today, we'll be looking at university expansion in the three decades after World War II to contextualise the reasons why the discourse became so persuasive. As such, this talk, focusing on the period up to the 1970s, does imply teleology. Those of you who have got a historical background will know that teleology is a historian's bet noir. It's something you don't do. But I apologise, but in policy history, that's an inevitable reality. So without any further ado, on to the history. According to David Edgerton, the ambitions of successive British governments after the Second World War had one aim chief amongst them to maintain for Britain a sharply differentiated third place in world affairs. Britain emerged from the Second World War bankrupt and militarily exhausted. The economic historian Jim Tomlinson notes, and I quote, that the Attlee government faced severe economic constraints in the pursuit of its policies is well known. The wearing out and destruction of capital during the war, the extraordinarily high degree of war mobilization, the sale of foreign assets and the retreat from overseas markets during the conflict left an economic situation worse than any government has had to deal with in modern times. In the name of economic recovery, other aims, colonial development, gender equality most obviously, were substantially compromised. And whilst the welfare state was established, by the end of the 1940s, its improvement was subject to severe scrutiny in the belief that there existed a conflict between welfare and further economic expansion. Yet Britain did seek both a welfare state and a continued international role. Economic policy was characterised by what Tomlinson calls the dominance of the political. The dominant political objective, a key continuity between British governments of all political stripes in the post-war period, was maintaining Britain's global power. The arguments, Tomlinson says, within at Labour and the Attlee period were not about whether Britain was or should aspire to be a great power, but how this power was to be maintained or restored and how it was to be exercised. This led to art rearmament, the Korean War, and to re-educational reform, including a new political economy of higher education. But the state's turn to the universities after 1944 would have surprised observers of only a few years earlier. I mean, the 1944 Education Act, which many of our students are bored to tears with, says very little about universities. It's concerned with secondary organisation. There was no extant broader understanding in the UK prior to the Second World War of what higher education might look like. Um, beyond the small number of universities which existed at that time. The triggers for expansion in the immediate post-war period were political, economic necessity, couched in terms of global power, and social demand. During the war years, the universities, or their personnel, had played a huge part in staffing the Whitehall machine and in providing a plethora of scientists for war research, ranging from co-breaking of Bletchley Park to operational research for naval warfare and strategic bombing, without mentioning the British contribution to the Manhattan Project. Even the future historian Asa Briggs found himself co-breaking a Bletchley Park via the good officers of the Intelligence Corps. One of the leading advocates of academic science in the post-war period, Professor Frederick Lindemann, had himself served as the government's chief scientific advisor from 1940 and as Lord Charwell as paymaster general from 1942. The rise of scientific intelligence in the military sense of that term, epitomised in the work of R.V. Jones, gave the wartime Prime Minister Winston Churchill and the Whitehall machine more generally a new appreciation of the possibilities of science and technology. Churchill's successor as Prime Minister Clement Attlee had been in the wartime coalition and along with many of his Labour colleagues was familiar with the enhanced role of British academic science. More than this, Attlee now sought to harness science, primarily through the efforts of Herbert Morrison as Lord President of the Council, in the service of socialist planning during the first majority Labour government. In the 1940s and the 1950s, the status of British science had really been higher. As the world entered the nuclear age, academic science, academic science took on a new significance in British public life. Labour had an abiding interest in science fueled by the significant number of prominent scientists who were Labour supporters. This had a consequent impact on universities, which became, in Edgerton's words, both masculinised and scientised. By the 1950s, the level of military involvement in academic science caused academics concern, as the University Grants Committee complained to the Treasury about the extent of NATO funding for postgraduate physics. In 
In a more familiar narrative to historians of post-war Britain, social demand was also key. The British state and its education system also had to find a way to integrate a new, upwardly mobile, technocratic class which had its origins in the pre-Second World War period. George Orwell described them thus, and I quote, After 1918, there began to appear something that had never existed in England before. People of indeterminate social class. In 1910, every human being in these islands could be placed in an instant by his clothes, manners and accent. This is no longer the case. Above all, it is not the case in the new townships that are developed as a result of cheap motor cars and the southward shift of industry. To that civilization belong the people who are most at home in and most definitely of the modern world. The technicians, the higher paid skilled workers, the airmen and their mechanics, the radio experts, the film producers, the popular journalists, the industrial chemists. They are the indeterminate stratum at which the older class distinctions are beginning to break down. This new class was to have a formative impact upon the social structure of post-war society, and it included the political elite amongst its ranks. Harold Wilson's father had, after all, been an interwar industrial chemist. Harold Perkin described these changes to the social structure as the latest stage in the rise of a professional society, organised around a social ideal of professionalism, that is to say, and I quote, based on trained expertise and selection by merit, emphasising human capital rather than passive or active property, highly skilled and differentiated labour rather than the simple labour theory of value, and selection by merit defined as trained and certified expertise. Both the Labour Party and the Conservatives saw this as a potential new electoral constituency to be tapped through their planning and modernisation agendas respectively. The new class was also seen to be vital to Britain's economic well-being and in turn her national survival in the nuclear age. The chairman of the Committee on Higher Education appointed in 1961, Lord Robbins, would later argue that a growing realisation of this country's economic dependence upon the education of its population has led to much questioning of the adequacy of present arrangements. Unless higher education is speedily reformed, it is argued, there is little hope of this densely populated island maintaining an adequate position in the fiercely competitive world of the future. The equation was simple. More higher education equals more economic growth. More economic growth equals global power. These were conclusions drawn by British politicians and policy makers long before the advent of globalisation theory or the knowledge economy. As the wider economy began to require ever more trained and sifted human capital in an age of self-conscious complexity, the universities became the principal gatekeepers. This transition to a professional society whose members required ever greater accreditation ensured the academic profession a centrality it lacked previously in public life. In Howard Perkins' phrase, academics had by the end of the 1960s become the key profession, the profession that opened the doors to all the others. The rise of this profession was mirrored by changes not only in society, but in the state apparatus, which grew inexorably from the war years onwards. Whether building a new Jerusalem or securing the future of the warfare state, the new state of the planners required more trained expertise if it was to match its promises in the realms of both welfare and international politics. Attention turned to the universities. Universities now had to be national means for trained scientific manpower. Engineers, doctors, teachers, economists, administrators and scientific and technological research that would enable Britain to compete militarily and economically in a geopolitical environment far less favourable than it had been in the past. To this end, the Wartime Coalition commissioned the Barlow Report into Scientific Manpower, which was published in May 1946. The report recommended a doubling of the output of graduate level scientists within 10 years and was the catalyst for a reassessment of the relationship between the universities and their state sponsor. The Barlow Committee featured a number of prominent evangelists for the state support of science who had gained credibility through their war work. Both Patrick Blackett and Solly Zuckerman contributed to the report. Barlow characterised the situation in dramatic terms, noting that least of all nations can Great Britain afford to neglect whatever benefits the scientists can confer upon her. If we are to maintain our position in the world and restore and improve our standard of living, we have no alternative but to strive for that scientific achievement without which our trade will wither, our colonial empire will remain undeveloped, and our lives and freedom will be at the mercy of a potential aggressor. Science and the university's responsibility to create more happy little scientists was a key aspect of what Edgerton described as the warfare state. Successive British governments, Edgerton argued, followed courses of actions intended to preserve that sharply differentiated third place and world affairs. Human capital, as Barlow had implicitly argued, was critical in this endeavour. 
As early as 1947, the Conservative Research Department produced a report reflecting on Barlow, arguing that there was a need to encourage and develop the best brains in the country, irrespective of their social or economic status. The later 1940s and 1950s were years of near paranoia for the British government in international affairs, as exogenous shock after exogenous shock appeared to reinforce fears of the collapse of British power. And by 1946, it had become clear to ministers that the United States would not support Britain in her efforts to develop a nuclear weapon, irrespective of their contribution, Britain's contribution to the Manhattan Project. In 1947, the jewel in the crown, India, gained her independence. In 1956, there was the debacle of Suez, a quid pro, uh, sorry, there was the debacle of Suez, when Britain's subordination to the United States became acknowledged to the world. And in 1957, the launch of Sputnik induced panic in both the United States and Britain, in terms of the perceived missile gap and the alleged superiority of Soviet science. There's a beautiful line in the New Statesman in September 56 in the build-up to what happened with Sputnik. And they put it bluntly, we have either got to learn physics and mathematics or else Russian. Even Churchill, in one of his last sustained campaigns in public life, took it upon himself to promote a new science and engineering focused university college at Cambridge in the belief that Britain, more than most places, had to rely on the brains of her people. He wrote to Harold Macmillan in 1958, I have been convinced for a long time that we ought to do all we can to improve British technological education. I was warned by the prof, the aforementioned Lord Charwell, as long ago as 1954, that the Russians were getting ahead not only of us, but of the Americans. His forebodings have been only too well justified. In such a febrile climate, political parties, particularly in the build-up to the 1964 general election, would seek to outbid each other in the rhetoric of education for economic growth and science for industrial performance. These provided key strands in an emerging political economy of higher education that was anchored in ideas of global economic competitiveness. The genesis of this strand long predates the Second World War, as the historians in the room will know. The fear of the increasing economic competition and the peril of consequent national decline animated the British public mind since the Victorian era, and it played a large role in the development of the education sector in those years. As Halsey and Trow put it in 1971, there had been a national movement which aimed to bring higher technological education into the service of industry. It was inspired by fear of industrial competition from the continent, appreciation of the industrial benefits gained by Germany, France and Switzerland from their polytechnics and admiration of the American land-grant colleges. That national movement helped foster the civic universities, places like Liverpool, Manchester, Sheffield and many of the technical colleges which gave birth to them. It was the civic universities which really are in many ways the heroes of the university expansion story. But they did remain marginal to its discursive politics, at least until the 1970s. <clears throat> Their big moment, if you like, would come with the arrival of research-intensive discourses focused on the knowledge economy, but that was to come later. Now, key to the development was a rhetorical arms race between two main parties, which was conducted in the language of political economy, set in the context of national objectives. Labour, consistently, under leaders from Hugh Gates School and Harold Wilson, right through to Tony Blair more recently, have sought to manipulate the discursive politics of higher education to square the circle between what Mike Sanderson has described as social equity and industrial need. The Conservatives, meanwhile, in the post-war period, sought to integrate higher education into their opportunity state rhetoric as part of their modernisation agenda. Both parties' policies, like most party policy, were rooted in electoral realities. For the Conservatives, as Mark Jarvis has shown, quote, the recovery from the shock 1945 election defeat developed into a myth. It was perceived as a period of radical overhaul of both organisation and policy. This included both acceptance of the welfare state and the maintenance of full employment. Policy moves in direct contrast into war conservatism. Jarvis argues that the Tories believed that the embourgeoisement of the working classes was integral to their electoral success. The more the middle class the working class got, the more likely the Tories were to win elections. He's no doubt correct. But what is critical is that Labour also believed this. Hence their neurosis over the relationship to non-manual workers and the decline of traditional class affiliations on the back of three consecutive election defeats in the 1950s. The different agendas of both parties encompass similar ideas about technocracy and modernisation. The impact of technocracy and revisionism on the Labour Party in the 1950s and 1960s has often been noted, but the parallel within the Conservative Party has been underplayed by comparison. Higher education fits in because it was a malleable rhetorical vehicle. It was new. It could be reconstructed to fit either the Tory language of opportunity or the Labour language of white heat. It was this rhetorical shift 
and the integration of higher education within the wider political economy of government in the 1950s and 1960s that disempower traditional elite actors such as the University Grants Committee, the Treasury Committee established in 1919 which had overseen the universities. It was not a process that went uncontested, but it was an un inexorable tradition that ultimately broke the university's monopoly on higher education and destroyed the UGC itself. As a brief case study, in July 1946, an unremembered debate took place within the British cabinet. It was the early stages of the Attlee government, which was struggling to deal with what Keynes called the financial Dunkirk. There was military overstretch. There was the possibility of imminent bankruptcy. Questions of global power also loomed large. In March 46, Churchill, now leader of the opposition, made his famous Iron Curtain speech in the United States. The wartime marriage of convenience between the Western Allies and the Soviet Union had broken down. And in February, the British had eventually restarted their independent atomic weapons program following the snub by the US. In this light, it's probably unsurprising that political historians haven't been too fussed about looking at cabinet minutes of a debate over universities. But it's probably more surprising that historians of education haven't given it more prominence. Tom Owen, who's written an article on the governance of British higher education in the period, doesn't talk about it at all. Jean Bocock at least talks about it from the point of view of what it meant for the Labour Party. And yet, this little, aborted little conversation between several cabinet ministers over the place of universities in the post-war settlement is directly connected with the world historical problems that Britain faced and will continue to face. The cabinet debate is instructive in several respects. It involves several ministers, including Natalie himself. It was a response to an initiative from Herbert Morrison, the Lord President of the Council, the minister with departmental responsibility for science. Following the publication of the Barlow Report, the Cabinet debate on higher education began because the government was concerned that universities would not rise to the challenge. Um, unconcerned with national needs remote, they need to be redirected with greater force towards the sciences, technology and expansion of student numbers. As Morrison put it, I am not sure whether as a government we have yet faced the full implications of the unprecedented demands which we made on the universities if our country is to get from them the men and women it needs for the purposes and of the quality it requires. Teachers, administrators, economists, scientists, doctors, to take but a few examples, will be wanted in vastly increased numbers. But what assurance do we have that the universities will deliver the goods? Ellen Wilkinson, the Minister for Education, went much further. She saw total control over the universities for her department, forcibly reconstituting their governing body and ending its autonomy and ensuring the closer integration of universities with government planning. Now, had this been publicly known at the time, and I'm going to speak in euphemisms, this would have been highly controversial, to say the least. The UGC had been seen since its foundation as the body which safeguarded academic autonomy and academic freedom within the higher education sector against the depredations of government. And if you just want to deepen the irony still further, in 1942, British intelligence supplied a report to the Cabinet and to the UGC where it stated that one of the key factors in the rise of national socialism in Germany was the supine nature of, of German universities in their relationship to the state. So the British were very self-conscious about this idea that the universities were autonomous and should remain so. Things changed. The Chancellor of the Exchequer refused uh, Wilkinson's offer, instead decided to change the committee's terms of reference. It was a relatively slight change, but it was pregnant with implications, which was simply this, that they should also consider the preparation and execution of such plans for the development of universities as may from time to time be necessary to ensure that they are fully adequate to national needs. Now, the UGC was the forerunner of Hefke. What this near miss tells us is about the complacent attitude of many within the university establishment about academic autonomy in the 1950s and the 1960s. I mean, English academics consistently trumpeted how virtuous their method of governance was, particularly compared to foreign systems. W.R. Niblett said, Perhaps no nation has on the whole, all said and done, so wise a system of financing its universities as we have. The control, as he put it, was wise, particularly because it was so loose. Academics spent the money without guidance from government and without being subjected to audits by the NAO. Well, it wasn't the NAO in those days. It was the Comptroller and Auditor General. Now, Nibbler can be forgiven for his self-congratulatory tone. He was on the UGC. He had a reason for saying this worked. But W.O. Lester Smith, Professor of Education at London, writing in 1957, went further. Our universities are outstanding examples of our belief in academic freedom. In some other Western societies, university teachers have in recent years had to testify to their political loyalty, but there's been no such demand here. Nor has there been any encroachment to university affairs by the state. Statements like this could only be made because they were ignorant of the debates that were taking place in Cabinet and in other parts of the warfare state, because these remain confidential until the opening of the archive 30 years later. 
But the debate foreshadowed what was to come, and dissatisfied with the situation in universities in terms of both the pace of expansion and the nature of what was being taught, the Ministry of Education tried and tried again. It sought this time not to take control of the universities, but to break the monopoly on degree level education. When it finally broke the university monopoly, it did so through the vehicle of technological and scientific education, the areas of education that were most closely allied in the government's mind to economic growth. Concerns about the quality and quantity of education in science and technology were aired before the war's end. In 1943, the Treasury Civil Servant Sir Alan Barlow chaired a committee on the scientific civil service. In 1946, he published his report on scientific manpower. In 1944, Lord Percy was asked by the President of the Board of Education, Butler, to look into issues surrounding higher technological education, and his report was published in 1945. The pace did not let up. Higher education in science and technology was a staple of editorials in nature through the later 1940s. It was the focus of a new advisory committee on education for industry and commerce, NASIC, from 1948. It was the subject of a TES special entitled The Case for a Technical University, focusing on the supposed need for a British MIT in 1950. And it was the focus of a government statement on the sector following NASIC's report in 1951. It's a little known but key aspect as well of American conditions for martial aid to Britain that it was used to develop a science and technological base in order to modernise the British economy and reduce British dependency. Ernest Bevan, as Minister of National Service, had called for a greater integration of science with industry. He put it in a British Association conference later. It is true to say that science is not merely a place in industry, but is in fact dominating industry. Industry must become more receptive to scientific progress and be induced to accelerate development, particularly in peacetime, to the speed which we have achieved in war. Lord Walton went further. No one who has been in government during these five years can be blind to the fact that the national policy on science education during this century brought us very near to defeat. We were living at a time when the men of science were making great discoveries over wide fields of knowledge. We gave them little support in their pursuits and small encouragement in the wider application of their knowledge. The universities were almost divorced from the practical men of affairs, and deliberate planning to meet either the needs or the dangers of the future met with no encouragement. Herbert Morrison put it more succinctly. The Barlow proposals were of the utmost importance to ensuring the nation has an adequate supply of qualified scientists. If we do not do so, we cannot maintain, far less improve, our position in the world and our standard of life at home. Such statements were symptomatic of what Edgerton described as the warfare state, which in his words pursued highly nationalistic economic and innovation policies. Higher education was not immune from these policies. As Edgerton puts it, the warfare state, and not the welfare state, had the decisive influence on the wartime and post-war development of the British University. The university became a more scientific place, and a much more masculine place than it had been before the war, and by the 1960s a majority of male students were studying science or technology. The notorious art-science dichotomy, so central to the study of the university, also remained crucial in discussions of the British Civil Service. Yet such dichotomies, so central in the technocratic critique of the British state, higher education and the elite, were very misleading, not only in describing what was happening, but also what was at stake. Edgerton's point fundamentally is not that the British ignored science, but at their basic level they got it. Part of the way in which his government sought to apply pressure to the universities was through breaking the monopoly. This was a consistent theme in the post-war decades and resulted in two clear institutional departures. The foundations of the Colleges of Advanced Technology in the 1950s, the foundations of the Polytechnics or the upgrade in the Polytechnics in the 1960s. The Colleges of Advanced Technology became a possibility following the arrival of Sir David Eccles as Conservative Minister for Education in 1954. He was, in the former civil service Maurice Cogan's words, the first Minister for Education who automatically assumed that educational expenditure was an economic investment. In his first appearance as minister before his back benches, he stated that there will be no success in education without sincerity, but in his opinion, the doubling of national prosperity in years was indissolubly linked with an increase in expenditure on education. Education should be the first social service. It was the basis of the defence of freedom. The cats were to be the fruit of Eccles' thinking in this regard. It took a crisis to bring them forth. In December 1955, Churchill, no longer Prime Minister, was speaking to a young Conservative rally in his constituency when he said that technical education was an all-important subject. We are already surpassed by Russia on a scale which is most alarming. In the last ten years, Soviet higher technical education for mechanical engineering has been developed, both in numbers and in quality, to an extent which far exceeds anything we have achieved. This is a matter which needs the immediate attention of Her Majesty's Government. 
Churchill's successor, Eden, was ambushed at PMQs over this, and the furore prompted a white paper written by Eccles. In the white paper, Eccles argued for the upgrading of 25 regional colleges to CAT status, where they were granted Diploma of Technology qualification equivalent to a bachelor's degree. In the end, 10 made the cut, Aston, Battersea, Bradford, Bath, Brunel, Uist, Chelsea, Loughborough, City and Salford. Less than 10 years later, they were absorbed into the university sector following the Robbins report. The CATs were guaranteed passionate support from the Ministry because they, as the future Secretary of the UGC put it, arose out of the womb of the education system as it had been fertilised since 1944. Their assimilation into the university orbit after 1963 satisfied university views that the only higher education worthy of the name came from a university. But Robbins and others were enraged when the Ministry tried again with the creation of a new public sector of higher education in the form of the polytechnics, again with a focus on science and technology. By the time of the development of the CATS, there had been a party political consensus on the significance of higher education, and in particular science and technological education. Eden, in a speech at Bradford CAT, stated, The prizes will not go to the countries with the largest population. Those with the best systems of education will win. Science and technical skill gave a dozen men the power to do as much now as thousands did 50 years ago. Our scientists are doing brilliant work, but if we were to make full use of what we are learning, we shall need many more scientists, engineers and technicians. I am determined this shortage shall be let made good. By 1964, a Labour government was in office, and this government outbid the Tories on their own ground through the rhetoric of white heat. Harold Wilson, speaking at the new University of Sussex, said this, Britain is facing a testing time in the battle for economic strength and solvency. We, everyone here face the challenge of world competition. We can meet the challenge only by giving the fullest opportunity to the talents of all our young men and women. Robbins put forward the blueprint. We are carrying it through. The defeatism of those who said more means worse has been triumphantly repudiated. Victory at Waterloo was once ascribed to the playing fields of Eton. But the victory we are trying to win in the economic battle will be based on a wider range of playing fields, schools, lecture rooms, laboratories, design units and the skills and talents of all who contribute. When Crossland, Anthony Crossland, became Secretary of State for the new Department of Education and Science in 1965, the stage was set for the second attempt to establish a public sector of higher education, this time the polytechnic system. In his speech at Woolwich Polytechnic, he defended what he described as the dual system. We prefer the dual system for basic reasons. First, there is an ever-increasing need for vocational, professional, industrially-based courses in higher education. This demand cannot be met by the universities. It therefore requires a separate sector with a separate tradition and new outlook. Secondly, if the universities have a class monopoly as degree-giving bodies, and if every college which achieves high standards moves automatically into the university club, then the residual public sector becomes a permanent poor relation. This is bad for morale, bad for standards, and productive only of a rat race mentality. Thirdly, it is desirable in itself that a substantial part of the higher education system should be under social control, by which he meant state control, directly responsible to social needs. Now, although the University Grants Committee was now responsible to the Department for Education, there was still an official reluctance, at least publicly, for the government to set policies directly in relation to the universities. This would change. In the meantime, the polytechnics represented malleable vehicles, because they were new, um, for the Education for Economic Growth agenda that both parties wished to promote. It was significant upon their return to office in 1970, despite much criticism at the time, that the Conservatives did not dispense with the polytechnic experiment. The white paper which followed Woolwich placed student numbers directly in line with manpower planning, something Robbins had rejected outright for universities in 1963, and located polytechnics as part of the government's national plan for economic growth. Universities, cats, polytechnics, all were discussed in policy circles with their reference to their role in the economy and the implication this had for Britain's standing in the world. When Wilson returned to office in 1974, he continued the education for economic growth gospel. In a speech in Newcastle Polytechnic in 75, he argued that in the days of empire, education was no substitute for the cavalry charge and the ability to fire a gun. In the modern technological world, we can only survive and triumph as a people by developing the skills and resources of our people to their absolute peak. The economic ideology of higher education was, three decades from the end of the Second World War, firmly entrenched in British policymaking. Fast forward another two decades, and the rhetoric of the knowledge economy had migrated to these shores, an evolution of Daniel Bell's conclusions in the coming of post-industrial society, that the work of the future will primarily be structured around knowledge rather than things. The knowledge-based economy has had its interpreters in Britain, 
For new labor, the interlocutor in chief was Charles Charlie Ledbetter, whose De Bono-style self-help tomes for economic malaise, living on thin air and up the down escalator, reflected his status as a senior advisor on policy to Tony Blair in the later stages of opposition and the early stages of government. Ledbetter's knowledge economy is distinct from the OECD one. His is the world of Baltic Creative in Liverpool and Media City UK in Salford. In 1998, he was the principal author of the DTI white paper, Building the Knowledge Driven Economy, in which he wrote, The generation, application and exploitation of knowledge is driving modern economic growth. Most of us make our money from thin air. We produce nothing that can be weighed, touched or easily measured. Our output is not stockpiled at harbours, stored in warehouses or shipped in railway cars. That should allow our economies, in principle at least, to be organised around people and the knowledge capital they produce. Ledbetter's views were savaged by Alison Wolfe, who subsequently authored the Walter Review into Vocational Education, on the basis that such views neglect the consistent significance of making things, and might be described in her words as snake oil rather than elixir. But despite Wolfe's forthright repudiation of Ledbetter and other reactions against the discourse, it is the great survivor of policy discourses. In the Brown Review, Lord Brown utters words that might have been spouted forth by any British educational policymaker since David Eccles. Graduates go on to higher paid jobs and adds the nation's strength. For a nation of our scale, we possess a disproportionate number of the best performing universities in the world, including three of the top ten. However, our competitive edge is being challenged by advances made elsewhere. Other countries are increasing investment in their HEIs and educating more people to higher standards. This discourse has been resilient precisely because, in the UK at least, it was the inheritor of a vocabulary that stretched back to the Second World War and even earlier. The Education for Economic Growth Gospel was attendant at the birth of mass higher education in England, was not constrained by political structures, and was not seen to square a circle between the new social demand and the perceived economic need of the state. Thus the seeds of a dangerous idea, the knowledge economy, were sown in Britain. So just to conclude, why might the discursive politics of education for economic growth the, which evolved into the knowledge economy, be considered dangerous. Partly because of the divorce between policy paradigms and reality, partly because of the contemporary and historical British political situations. Take the last bit first. Um, the nature of the British political settlement is often characterised in elective dictatorship. There are very few breaks on government. And there is a sharp disjunction between the realities of British politics and policy making, of which law is the ultimate expression, and cultural understandings of politics. Popularly, a system where over half the legislators at Westminster are unelected, where the head of state gains this position through the arduous hurdles of gestation and birth, and where there is no inviolate freedom of speech, is known as a democracy. For this appearance to be maintained, it requires a respect for constitutional convention, or at least at a less elevated level, the acceptance of particular norms. In other words, there are things the government should and shouldn't do. But the problem is that in an organic constitution like Britain, the moral economy changes and can be remoulded by unscrupulous politicians appropriating the language of political economies to promote particular policy courses as the inexorable march of history. Such was the knowledge economy. The shift toward the knowledge economy ended any lingering reluctance the British state had in terms of interfering with higher education. University autonomy, which was challenged even in the immediate post-war years, is now a laughable concept, as institutions are autonomous neither from the state nor the dictates of the market. The self-governance of British higher education, as with many supposedly independent British institutions and sectors, has never been very resilient. The University Grants Committee was remade, then destroyed, by British governments primarily concerned to cut costs and reorient the system towards the market. In terms of policy paradigms, Bob Jessup has highlighted the goal between what he describes as the economy as an economic imaginary and the economy as an unknowable reality. As he puts it, the totality of economic activities is so unstructured and complex that it cannot be an object of calculation, management, governance or guidance. In other words, economic policy is always a blunt instrument. It is that much blunter when your own conception of what the economy looks like may actually be inaccurate. And a final point on the issue of policy making. As someone who's worked in policy development in Westminster, the key aspect of policy making is not ideology, it's saleability. As Mary Ferner and Barry Supple put it, even if persuaded by new data, politicians understand that people hold bedrock values and often refuse expert advice that points in a different direction. In the post-war decades, education for economic growth became a bedrock value of the British public. With a system where there is little in the way of meaningful breaks on the aspirations of government, a policy paradigm this malleable is profoundly dangerous. It's dangerous because it's seductive. 
Like social mobility, it's been marketed to the public as a way out of a zero-sum game. We can, as Charlie Ledbetter argues, live on thin air. Or to go back to the 1950s, as Eden reassured his public, the prizes won't go to the countries with the greatest natural resources, but the most well-trained people. Few statements could be more comforting to a post-imperial power in decline. This is not a process unique to the UK. The knowledge economy and marketisation is common to other places too. But it is one that, as Andrew McGettigan notes, is particularly dangerous here. The UK lacks some of the safeguards against the total disintegration of higher education, such as constitutional federalism, which are present in other countries. It has transitioned its entire system of financing teaching and learning, particularly in the humanities, in an incredibly short window. It is a policy gamble, as McGettigan argues, a bet that demand for higher education will continue to grow, driven by a perception of a knowledge-based economy, which, as Brown puts it, the universities remain the principal gatekeepers to. But it's no means certain that this is actually true. 21% of the UK labour market is overqualified. The rhetorical magic bullet of the university, either for global competitiveness or job security, may weaken in its purchase. The rhetoric of the knowledge economy in the 1990s and the 2000s was different and more forceful than the economic growth rhetoric that had preceded it, not least because it was built on the political successes of neoliberalism and Thatcherism. But it was only the culmination of a trend. For various reasons, the British state has long taken the view that its universities exist primarily to serve economic interest. There has long been an appreciation that they serve to disseminate knowledge and accreditate knowledge workers in economic terms. The danger they now face is that they have jeopardised the legacy of centuries of higher learning in the pursuit of just an economic imaginary, which may not exist in the way politicians say it does. As Wolf puts it, it is equally likely we already have an over-educated workforce as too few graduates. I'll leave you with this. Will there be a Wall Street crash in the stock of the university? Watch this space. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. I'm not sure I can follow that with any kind of wise comments, which I'm not going to attempt to do. Uh, I know we're running quite tight in terms of time, and I know people have got to teach, uh, or some people have got to teach anyway. Uh, if anybody's got any questions for Mike, now's your opportunity to ask them. Heather. lectures. Thank you. Um, and uh, he was quoting Perkin and the key profession which you mentioned and basically concluded that the academic profession is dead mm. uh, and he blamed the knowledge economy for this mm. and actually um, swore and wished everybody <laughs> under 40 good luck and then left the stage. <laughs> um, and, and it just struck a chord with me from what you were, what you were saying. I wondered about your view on that, about the individual uh, academic yeah. Uh, and whether there is such a thing as an academic profession anymore. And I also wanted to ask briefly, uh, you talked a lot about science and mm. mentioned the impact on the humanities right at the end. Yeah. Is it bleaker if you are in the humanities? And I think that's what we all think. Mm. Um, I just wanted to know what you thought about that. Take the last point first, yes. I think absolutely it's bleaker if you're in the humanities. I think what's interesting, the reason I place such emphasis on science, is we tend to think that the emphasis on STEM is recent. It's not. You know, it, it's actually quite long standing. You know that as well as well as I do. And um, so I think, yeah, the reality is bleak of the humanities, not least because of the changes now it's funded. With respect to Mike Shattuck, it's an interesting point because obviously Mike Shattuck worked for the UGC for a long time. And interestingly, yeah, an interesting thing about Mike Shattuck is that Mike Shattuck, in the later stages of the UGC in the 1980s, was one of the people who argued it wasn't responding quickly enough to what the state wanted. So because academics didn't respond quickly enough, they were basically bought out by the state, if you like. But no, I think he's right on all points, really. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, anybody else? Morgan. Thanks, Mike. That was a really interesting talk. Um, I, I was really interested in the way that you characterise uh, ed education and higher education, especially as a, a pre-political good. And mm. I wonder if there might be um, some kind of um, confusion of categories going on in relation to the notion of their democracy. Mm. So, um, you know, the, 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 the supposedly democratic state in the 20th century sees an um, expansion of higher education mm. as something that's uh, re required for economic growth, mm. but doesn't pay hindrance to, um, to the um, necessity of maintaining some sort of strong civil society. And mm. I wonder if you could um, you know, tell us anything, because there seem to be a lot of implicit yeah. ideas about the, the normative um, idea of the university belonging to maybe the public sphere. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you could um, say something about, about that to us. And I was, secondly, I was interested in 
Why are things different in Scottish universities? You wanted to separate this, mm. this out at the beginning. Yeah, I was, I'll take the second point last again, but you know, just with respect to Scotland, I mean, that's a historian's caveat, that in the sense that um, British historians are very guilty of saying, you know, Britain when they mean England. I think things are different partly because of the fact that, firstly, Scotland had a much stronger higher education tradition from much earlier, so they had more universities, full stop. They had greater links to the continent through the Scottish Enlightenment, um, and they had a greater leavening of further and higher education in a more differentiated sense than the British, sorry, than the English had done for a long period of time and the management of universities was different they were funded separately there was different uh, there were different grant lists and so on and so forth so there were, there, were, there were lots of different technologies i mean they changed that later on and it was brought into the british system but initially at least they were separate so i took mostly my focus as the english universities partly as well because the civics played a big role in that and they, they were more or less you know, they were as common in scotland on the first point about the democracy thing i think um in terms of civil society, don't get me wrong, there were policymakers, very sincere policymakers within all parties who thought to, you know, education and higher education in particular fostered a role within civil society. But I think what I'm trying to do really, and obviously I haven't got the other literature to stack up against it here because I don't have time, I'm trying to provide a rejoinder to the idea that, that was the normative position. I think the issue was that the education for economic growth idea was intrinsic to the birth of mass higher education here. I think, say, someone like Lionel Robbins, I know we talked about him the other day, but I think someone like Lionel Robbins was very keen on the civil society angle. But actually, his report, in practical terms, didn't translate into that many policy recommendations that were actually taken up. Um, so I think from the civil society point of view, I think the phrase I used before, you know, I think a lot of the, um, the technocratic, if you like, technological science education stuff, economic growth, was wrapped up in civil society garb to sell it to the public um, and also to elites within the academic establishment. But not concealed, but more or less encapsulated an economic agenda that was, or an economistic agenda that was dissimilar to that. So I understand what you mean about the confusion about terms, but I think the other is out there, just didn't have time to explore it. Okay, I think Paolo wanted to ask a question. Then David, and I think that's what we'll have to call it. I wanted to follow your dichotomy that you stated in the beginning. Um, mainly when you mentioned the Robbins report and mm. coming out to the, the white paper and even if you take high ambitions from the views in 2009. Yeah. Um, Taking into account the dichotomy that you put there between teaching, in, that is the skill intensive mm. knowledge economy and research, mm. research intensive knowledge economy. Um, now that is associated with intellectual property. Mm. In your opinion, who is benefiting from the 20 cent 21st century knowledge economy in the uh, English landscape of higher education? And um, how does this knowledge economy sit within the aim of higher education, tuition fees, and the quality of le the student learning experience? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, I think in the, it, it depends on what you understand by knowledge economy. One thing I didn't do in any significant length was do a definition. And that was actually deliberate rather than accidental because policymakers mean many different things when they talk about the knowledge economy. It's whatever suits them at the time. So in terms of constituencies that benefit from it, I think politicians benefit from it, I think, hugely because it allows them an avenue to promote any policies they want under this rubric that seems commonsensical. I think in terms of people within the, within the university and higher education sector, I think um, there are shall I say, certain senior managers who do very well out of it. I think there are, there are certain institutions that have done quite well out of it, out of attuning themselves to policy discourses and remaking themselves. But when I say institutions, that doesn't necessarily mean the academic or indeed the student. I think in terms of the comm commodification of undergraduate education, more contact hours doesn't necessarily in, in mean improved quality teaching. You know, I mean, I think everyone knows that. And I, don't, I think there's still a lag there. And I think in many ways, the rhetoric of the knowledge economy, as long as, particularly on the teaching side, not less so on the research side, but definitely on the teaching side, is very much outdistance what is actually being delivered. On the research side, I think that some of that is more or less demonstrable. The Work Foundation did a big program, which I'm sure you're aware of, looking at where that has been applied. So I think the research side is less difficult to trace. I think on the teaching side, Alison Moore's pretty much driven a coach and horses through that and shown, actually, is there really that much of a rate of return to your degree? Well, so, yeah. Thanks, Mike. That was really interesting. I suppose my one question is, has the the knowledge economy had its day. And um, I was struck by one of the things that you, that you mentioned was the, the, the change, I suppose, between the early rhetoric of the knowledge economy, which is the, um, the knowledge that's required for uh, advanced industrial modernity, the control of complex means of production, mm 
and then there starts to be um, a shift, I suppose, towards an information economy and training, uh, training yeah. slash educating a whole uh, batch of information managers who were more or less obsolete at the moment that they graduated because of the, mm. the advances that had gone on within information technology. Um, is that is that something that you can read back into the past, or am I guilty of kind of reading the present into the past? Was there a tendency to perhaps train people for um, what seemed to be adva an advanced knowledge economy, but which in fact was was kind of uh, you know based more, on the past? You know more, you know more guilty of reading back into the past than me. That's what I, that I'm doing that myself. But yeah, I think absolutely. The direct analogy with the 1950s, actually. A lot of big issues in engineering in the 1950s. So, for example, people would finish engineering degrees, but actually the pace in industry had changed so much that, you know, oftentimes people teaching engineering weren't necessarily as up-to-date as maybe they might be. And so that's part of the justification that was used rhetorically for the cats. These were people who would be practitioners as well as t educators who would straddle the boundary. And the introduction of the sandwich course as well, the idea that CPD and bringing people back. So, no, I think this is a rhetorical thing that has been reused and reused again. With respect to the international dimension of it, on the um, knowledge economy, the OECD, there's a great bit in Bob Jessup's work where he says, you know, the OECD latched onto the knowledge economy because they realised that everyone liked it. The OECD wants to influence governments. Previously, the OECD used to use a system called the National Innovation System, but that wasn't as catchy. Then they realised the knowledge economy was catchier and that encapsulated what they wanted to say more. So I, that's why I do think, yeah, a lot of this is rebranding, and I do think, yeah, you can see an idea, you know, with a fast-paced change in the nature of the economy. Yeah, that happened in the 1950s as well as now. It may be that the velocity of the flows has increased, but it's difficult to say. Hmm. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. I'd like to, this to go on for longer, but unfortunately it's nearing 2 o'clock, and I know uh, we said 2 o'clock was the point at which we'd finish. Um, it uh, comes to me to say thanks to Mike. Uh, before I do, uh, I want to say that um, I'm mindful, having listened to Mike, about the depth of research and scholarship that's gone in to uh, get to the point where he's been able to talk with so much conviction and fluency about what is an incredibly uh, important area. I'm also mindful at the same time, if you look at the debates in the 1850s about technical education in particular, when the context wasn't higher education, it was state education for all. What's new? The same intensity of debate, in fact, in Parliament where they were discussing technical education, although it was a peripheral issue, there was a, an intense public discourse about, the, uh, about education. So, you know, it's, we repeat these debates. But obviously, because we work in higher education, this is uh, an incredibly important area to us. Mike, that was incredibly thorough, very, very illuminating, very interesting. I wish it could have gone on for longer. Um, but thank you very much. Uh, just to round things off, uh, the next one in the sequence is on January the 13th, I think, or January the 14th, and it's the dangers of dyslexia. So we shift focus. Thank you very much. Cheers, Tom. Well done, mate. That was brilliant. That was